Well, it is so good to see you all here, uh, whether you're live at our campus in Charlotte or your live stream. I'm Talbot Davis. I'm the pastor of Good Shepherd Church. And as always, one of my, the, the real highlight of my week is being able to have this time together on a Sunday morning. This is the first message in this new series called That's Good News, a series of messages and conversations and small group studies and everything we're doing together that, that is designed to uh, sort of equip and motivate and inspire you to take, if you've said yes to Jesus, to help others make that same declaration and take that same step in their lives. Today's message is called, What Makes the Good News Good? And it comes from the Bible, like messages here should. And if you have your Bible with you, I want to invite you to locate in your Bible the, uh, the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Maybe your Bible looks like mine, and maybe it's loaded on your phone, and maybe none of those things are true about you, in, in which case the words are going to be up on the screen just when they need to be up on the screen. So you're covered as far as seeing the Bible, make, making sure for yourself that I'm just not making it up when I look in my Bible and read. You're going to be covered on all that. And, and we think that all of that is super important because the biblical library, and it, and it is, the Bible is not the good book. It is the great library, and when we're in 1 Corinthians, we're looking at the section of the library devoted to correspondence. It is a letter written by pastor, missionary, author Paul, probably 55 AD or so, He's, and it's written to the people in the church in the ancient Greek city of Corinth. The people who lived there were called Corinthians. That's where the name comes from. So we, we get to we kind of kind of eavesdrop in on some conversation and, and look over Paul's shoulders. He writes to someone else and see all the ways that his message to them connects with our lives that we are living today. And, and those are just kind of facts that a lot of people don't know. And when you know them, they really help you understand what the Bible is about. The, the second thing that, that we hold dear at this church, you may not believe it yet, and that is okay. We, we, we have discovered over the last 10 days or so, that clarity is kindness. And that when a church is clear about what it believes and where it stands, that, that is a real a rallying point. And you may not believe what we believe about the Bible yet, but we're just going to continue to believe it and, and, and hope you'll come along one day. And others of you, you're, you're like on board. But we believe that this is the only library like it on earth, that God breathed his life into its words put his truth onto its pages. The Bible is inspired and eternal and true. And out of that conviction comes a custom that when we talk about the Bible here, we lift it up. And again, if you're new and uh, you hadn't seen this before, you're like, whoa, this is unusual. And, and we're like, yes, it is way unusual. But we've discovered this is a moment of oddity that shapes our identity as a community. That we're a collection of people who, by and large, don't really have life figured out very well. Can I hear an amen for that? But we know who does. And because we know he does, we're glad to surrender ourselves to his authority. Before I say anything else, let's pray. So, Lord, thank you for your goodness and your word and the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and thank you for the privilege you give me of, of standing up and admitting I'm a wreck without you. But put back together by you, that I am powerless without you, but because of you, I'm never helpless. And so I call on that help, the Holy Spirit, to fill me and everyone within the sound of my, thank you, Lord, more. Everyone within the sound of my voice for this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there is that uh, phrase that I suspect most of you have heard of, if not all of you, that, that some things have to be seen in order to be believed. That some things really do appreciate their, 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 their grandeur or their wonder or their oddity or their strangeness. You've got to have a visual on the matter, that you've got to see some things with your own two eyes really to believe the thing you're talking about. Like, like the grandeur of the Grand Canyon. Got to be seen to be believed. Or, or the beauty of the Mona Lisa. You got to see it to believe it. Or the somberness 
of the Ground Zero Memorial, the 9-11 Memorial at Ground Zero in Manhattan. Man, you've got to see it to believe it. And actually, out of those three, I haven't seen any of them. <laughs> or the cleverness of that streaming show, The Chosen, all about Jesus and his followers. You, you have to see it to believe how good and how clever it is. I had people for years telling me, you got to see it, Talbot. You got to see the chosen. I've got, I, I, don't, I don't have to do anything you're telling me I have to do. <laughs> and then I saw it and they were right. You, you got to see it to believe it. The strangeness of the two-headed snake. You got to see it to believe it, and that's a copperhead right there, and if the first bite doesn't kill you, the second one for sure will. Some things have to be seen to be believed, which puts those of us in this place who are starting this brand new series, That's Good News, a series that unapologetically is going to be all about taking the, the good news that people who have said yes to Jesus, and if that's not you yet, that's okay. Just listen in on how we think and how we talk. But the series is un unapologetic about how to take that good news that people who've said yes, how we have it in here, and how we can then take that good news and share it with friends or family or coworkers or even people in church who aren't at that same place yet and get them to persuade them to say yes to the same Jesus we said yes about, yes to a while ago. That's what this series is all about. And yet, if you're one of those people, and yeah, I'm a Christian and I want to share the good news, or yeah, I'm a Christian and I don't know how to scare, share the good news, or yeah, I'm a Christian and the thought of scaring the, sharing the good news scares me to death, wherever you are on that continuum, we have a dilemma we are in a pickle because some things have to be seen to be believed. We're, we're in a fix. Because I don't know if you know this or not, our faith, the Christian faith is built on a fact. The Christian faith is not built on a feeling. It's not built on a morality. It's not built on an ethic of be a good person. It's not all about doing unto others as, as, as you would have them do unto you. It's not even about the discovering yourself. It's not about any of those things. The Christian faith is built on the fact of a dead body coming back to life. That is the foundation of the Christian faith, that Jesus is resurrected, the resurrected king is resurrecting me, and yet it's built on the fact of the resurrection, and there, not, not a single person in here saw it. There was no body cam video that day that, that Jesus rose from the dead. Not a single one of you saw the resurrection. And, and that, that fact, that may explain the, 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 the fact that our faith is built not on a feeling, it's not about being a good person, it, it, it's built on a resurrected body, and yet none of us saw the resurrected body. Maybe that explains some of the, the, the inherent hesitation a lot of us have to sharing the good news. We're, we're, in, a, we're in a pickle as we start out this series. But, but the good news that we're not the first ones in the pickle. We're not the first ones to face this dilemma. Paul, pastor and missionary and author, when he is writing his letter to the church in the ancient Greek city of Corinth called the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, he, he faces all kind of odds as he writes this letter to this church. And do you know why? Because they consider him the Johnny come lately of the disciples. Because unlike James, and unlike Peter, and unlike John, and unlike even Judas, Paul had not seen Jesus during his time on earth. Paul had never walked with him. Paul had never talked with him. Paul had never told him that he was his own. Paul was not there on Good Friday at the crucifixion. He wasn't there on Easter Sunday at the resurrection. And in fact... In the years after the resurrection and when the Christian movement start, began, Paul, is, as you may know, he spent time murdering Christians before he was ever a missionary for Christ. 
And so with all those factors, the Corinthians, they did not believe that this guy had any bona fides like, like the, the rest of the apostles because some things have to be seen to be believed. And Paul had not seen Jesus in the same way all the other apostles had. And actually, a lot of you know this, the reason there's a second Corinthians is because first Corinthians didn't work. And the reason 1 Corinthians didn't work is because the Corinthian people didn't think Paul had any credibility to be talking about what he's talking about. And so all that sort of in the background and Paul, in a sense, having to demonstrate his own bona fides as a follower of Jesus, as a voice of authority. When he gets to chapter 15, he really lays out the heart of everything, the heart of everything that we call the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And look at how he begins in verse chapter 15, verse one, look at what he says. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. I love that. I want to remind you. You know why, why, why Paul has to remind the Corinthian church of the gospel? Because otherwise they'd forget. And actually, that is about 70% of why a church gathers together Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and why we sing the songs, and why we preach the messages, and why we declare the creeds, why we, in a sense, do the same things over and over and over again, because otherwise you'll get distracted. Otherwise, the world can get in the way. Otherwise, life can happen. And you can forget the guts of the gospel. And actually, a good preacher is just a really great nag. And, and I'll let you to decide whether I'm a good preacher or not. But good preaching and great nagging, great reminding are one and the same. We don't gather together. Hallelujah. We don't gather together to talk about new fads. We gather together to remember and to remind ourselves of ancient truths. Can I hear an amen for that? Yeah. And then, and then but look how Paul, look, look how the Corinthians got the gospel. The, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. So how did, how did the Corinthians get the gospel in the first place? Did they see it in action? Nope. Did he tweet it out? No. Nope. Did he send him a text? No. He preached it. He told it. The only reason the Corinthian church knew the gospel is because someone had told them the gospel. Verse two, by this gospel, you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Again, you got to hold to this gospel, this good news tenaciously and relentlessly because life will happen and the world will get in the way and it will very much try to distract you from the gospel and convince you that these things on which you have staked your life are actually lies. Verse three, for what I received, I love that. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. For what I received. Do you, do, you, do you know what he's saying there? I didn't think the gospel up. I didn't dream the gospel up. The gospel is not my invention. I received it. And what happened with Paul is that the resurrected Christ confronted him. The resurrected Christ converted him. Essentially said, stop killing Christians and become a missionary for Christ. The risen Christ confronted, converted. And then Paul spent years and years and years sitting at the feet of Christians with more experience than he had, learning and relearning and relearning the guts of the gospel. Don't know if you knew that was part of his story. He sat at the feet of people who reminded him. He's reminding the Corinthians of the same things that he got reminded of for years on his own. And then he moves on. For what I received, I passed on to you. See, I got told, so I told you, as of first importance, which, which means, and he, and he doesn't spell this out, but it means that of if there's some things that are first importance, that means there are other elements of the faith that are second importance, like color of the carpet in the worship center. That's second important stuff. Whether or not your, your church has a pipe organ or a worship band, that's second important stuff. Whether your pastor wears a robe or jeans, that's first importance. No, that's second. <laughs> that's, 
That's second important stuff. So all, all that stuff is second importance. And then he very kindly spells out for us the guts of the gospel. What is the first important stuff? This is thrilling. Look where he goes in, in the next part of verse three, that Christ died for our sins. Okay. So not just that Jesus died, but why? He didn't die as our role model, apparently. He didn't die as a revolutionary. He didn't die to inspire us. He died as a substitute for our sins. We we have a problem. We have a sin problem that either we ignore or deny. We, I'm good. You good? I'm good. You good? No. Actually, none of us are good. We have a sin problem that's comprehensive, and Jesus is the singular solution. In fact, I, I, I love the, t- talking about this in relation to karma. Y'all know karma? And I don't mean credit karma. I mean like karma, karma, the, the religious concept, karma. And, and you've heard, oh, I hope they get karma. Nobody ever wants karma. I hope I get karma for that. No. Everybody, we want other people to get the karma. Because what happens in karma? You get what you deserve. Precisely. That's karma. In grace, Jesus got what you deserve. And I don't know about you, but I will take grace over karma anytime. Jesus, yeah, Jesus didn't just die. He died for sins. And and look what where Paul goes next. According to the scriptures. And then verse four, that he was buried. Okay, why does it have to say that? Why, why does it have to? I don't know if you know this, but when, when people were crucified, Jesus is not the only person who's ever crucified. When people were crucified in the Roman Empire, the, the, the Romans left them up on the cross for days and days and days. And the reason that they, could, they left them on the cross is so that they would, first of all, they would be eaten by scavengers. And so that they would become a reminder and a warning to would-be criminals. This is what happens to people who defy the empire. So Paul has to give us this detail that seems obvious to us that he was buried because unlike everybody, virtually everybody else who was crucified with Jesus, it was Nicodemus, it was Joseph of Arimathea who very carefully and tenderly took that body and they gave, hallelujah, they gave Jesus a proper burial so that he could have an improper resurrection, which is what Paul tells us next. In verse five, in the rest of verse four, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Jesus was died. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus was raised. All of it, according to the scriptures, anticipated by the Old Testament scriptures, recorded in the New Testament gospels, all of it according, wasn't spur of the moment. He's the, he's the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, God's plan from eternity in the past. And then that, that's first important stuff. What's the gospel? It's that first important stuff. And then Paul goes on this crescendo of appearance. So if you have a, your Bible with you, every time I read the word appeared, go ahead and circle that. And, and, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then the 12. And that, after that, he... See, I didn't give you the instructions. We're going we're gonna to read this collaboratively. So when I come to appear, do you read it out loud? After that, he... Appeared. To more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, meaning this stuff happened in about 33 AD. It's 20 years or so later. Most of these people are still alive, though some have fallen asleep which is Paul's nice way of saying, they done dead. Verse seven. (laughs) Then he, to his own brother who had trouble believing in him, then to all of the apostles, and last of all, he, to me also, as to one abnormally born. So there's appeared, appeared, appeared to Peter, to the 12, to 500, 
to the women who were the first in the tomb anyway, to the 500, to some apostles, to James who didn't believe, Paul many years later who had murdered Christians and is now called to be a missionary for, for Christians, appeared, 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 appeared. They got to see it, to believe it. But do you see what all of that implies? All these people, 515 people, they approximately, they got to see it, to believe it. But then what happened? They started telling it and they told it to people who told it to people who told it to people who told it to Paul, who told it to the Corinthians, who told it to others, who told it to still others. And ultimately who told it to you and where that lands us on the first day of this series, that's good news. While the common phrase means some things have to be seen to be believed for the gospel, nope. The gospel has to be told to be believed. Yeah, the, the more you tell it, the more you believe it. And the reason that any of you have ever said yes to Jesus in your life is because those same Corinthians I mean, they might, they, they might not have believed that Paul's words were inspired and eternal and true, but we do. But those same Corinthians told people who told people who told people who told your Sunday school teacher, who told your mom, who told your best friend, Philip Chalk, who told you. Yeah. We, some things have to be told to be believed. And the purpose of this whole series is to inspire us to become a church full of tattletales. Because here's the alternative. So, so, so many of us, rather than becoming good news sharers, becoming tattletales, because of this combination of a lack of confidence or anxiety or what happens if they say no, it's okay, they said no to Jesus too. Worse things have happened to better people. We, we end up holding all that good news and we become good news hoarders instead of good news sharers. And when we become good news hoarders, what, what, what is it? We, we turn into human cul-de-sacs. And what do cul-de-sacs do? Does anybody live on a, on a cul-de-sac? Nobody drives into your whole cul-de-sac to get somewhere else. <laughs> cul-de-sacs collect. And that's what so many of us do with this good news. We hoard what we should be sharing. And this series is all about giving you the, the skills and the resources and the passion so that you have the opportunity to stop hoarding the good news to, and, and begin sharing it so that we will be a collection of blood-bought, spirit-filled tattletales. The gospel has to be told to be believed. Some of you, I know what some of you are thinking right now, because I've been in your seat and I've sat some of these, thought some of these same things. Some of you may remember that, that uh, well-known quote that is attributed to St. Francis, uh, a, a, a Catholic saint back from back in the Middle Ages, actually the current Pope Francis, he's named after Saint. Yeah, you got it that time. Yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, and, and he, there's this quote attributed to St. Francis where he said, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. That sounds so good. That sounds so wise. It sounds so unoffensive. And it is such baloney. Balderdash. Malarkey. And why? Because the gospel is words. It's a story of a dead body coming back to life and still alive. And if we don't tell it, people can't know it. And if you're one of those people, you think, well, I'm just not comfortable. I'm just not confident. I can't do it. I can't, 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 can't. And I'm just, I'm just going to show it by my actions. And that'll make people want to believe. Do you really think you're that good? Don't overrate your own goodness because even the best of you and this church is full of amazing people. Even the best of you is not good enough. It still involves that tattle telling of the gospel. It's so interesting. I was talking to a, 
a young adult a little while back and he kind of wandered away from faith and now is coming back and he was telling me a little bit of his, of his story and that, man, I had so much anxiety and my anxiety was rooted in so much uncertainty. You know, there's so many things about life I was uncertain about and that caused anxiety. And, 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 then, he, and then he said, I didn't lead him to say this. He just said this. That, 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 but I knew, I realized that Jesus was the one thing in life I could be sure about. And now that he has my life again, the anxiety has sort of dealt with itself. But here's what you need to know. That young adult had been told the stories. He'd been told the story that supports the story. The reason he he could come back was because, hello, he had been told in the first place. The gospel has to be told to be believed. And Good Shepherd, these stakes in in this whole conversation, these stakes are high. Not not to be dramatic here, but to be a little dramatic. When it says in in verse 3 that that Christ died for our sins, Christ died for our sins, there's really, really two ways of going through life. You, you can either understand that Christ died for your sins or you can die in your sin. And the consequence of dying in your sin is hell. And hell is eternal separation from God. And nothing in scripture allows us to deny it or minimize it. And that's why at the core of everything, we want this church to be a blood-bought, spirit-filled, hell-emptying army full of tattletales. The gospel has to be told, to be believed, and the great news about the telling it is it blesses not only the tellee, but the teller. Did you catch that? That the more you tell it, the deeper you believe it. Your faith is never more alive than when you're giving it away. Which, Which leads me to the kind of sad conclusion that maybe the reason so many of us waffle and waver at any thought of sharing our faith with anybody in, 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 in a manner that might invite rejection or offense and we just shy away from it. Maybe it's because we only half believed in the first place. If one-tenth of what we believe is true, we should be 10 times as excited to share it. The gospel has to be told to be believed. And the more you tell it, the deeper you'll believe it, the more alive your faith will become, which takes me back, (laughs) takes me back to these very first tattletales Paul talks about. Remember them? The women at the tomb, and Peter, and the 12, and the 500, and the James, the doubting brother, and other apostles, and finally, 20 years later, Paul himself, they were, they were told, so they would tell, and they told others who would tell, who would tell, who would tell, who told you. And in every case, the reason they had such conviction to tell is because they knew that Jesus had come through for them, that they knew that the resurrected king was resurrecting them, and that he had healed what was broken. He had forgiven what was shameful. He'd filled up what was empty. And he'd given purpose where people were hollow. Nothing has changed. People here who've said yes to Jesus, it's because he forgave you of the most shameful things in your history. It's because he gave you a purpose for living when you'd given up on it. It's because he gave you a freedom from a compulsion that you thought was going to have you to the very end. At every point, at every level, Jesus came through for you. All with this understanding that you would be a spirit-filled tattletale for him. Here's what we're going to do. 
I told you this series is all about giving you opportunities and empowerment and even inspiration to tell. So here's what we're going to do. I'm, I want to invite you. I, I, I'm, I suspect a good chunk of you have your mobile devices with you. So I want you to go ahead and pull out your mobile device. A preacher during a sermon on Sunday morning says, pull out your cell phone and open up an app. And maybe you open it up to Facebook, a social media app, maybe to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, now called X. Don't go to X, just go to Twitter. We're in church. So go to, go to, to op, open up that app. And here's what I want you to do. Uh, I, yeah, I want you to finish the sentence. I believe Jesus because. And go ahead and do that. We're going to give you a few minutes to do that. I believe Jesus because. And after you describe why you believe Jesus, end it with hashtag, that's good news. And we are going to flood social media with a bunch of good shepherd tattletales. So take a few moments and share the good news. I love watching y'all do that. I love it at nine o'clock and I love it at 1030. And uh, we're flooding the internet, which is full of so much bad news with good news today. I wanna pray us into what's next. Father, thank you that we were told so that we would tell. And thank you that the more we tell the gospel, the deeper we believe it. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, would you